Good morning. I'm the head visa officer here. Welcome to our monthly talk on applying for British visa. We used to give everybody photocopies of the different forms you have to fill in, but found that that was rather expensive. So to save money and paper, we now use slides that you can see on the screen behind me. By the way, this and the other forms you will see are the same forms that you will see if you go online to UK Visas. That's one word. dot gov. dot uk. They are very similar to the hard copy you will find in our offices. The first question: Do you need a visa to enter the UK? If you are not a British citizen or a citizen of one of the European Economic Area countries, you may need an entry clearance before you travel to the UK. Entry clearance means the application process for people who need a visa to travel to the United Kingdom. And for those who don't need a visa for a short stay, how short is depends on their nationality, but who intend a longer stay or to settle in the UK. People from certain countries known as visa nationals, the first type I mentioned, need an entry clearance to enter the UK for any reason. Those from other countries need only one for certain reasons. For example. To live as the wife or husband of a British citizen, the entry clearance certificate that we all call a visa is placed in your passport or travel document. The job of an entry clearance officer at a British embassy or consulate or other mission overseas is to decide if you qualify for entry before you travel to the United Kingdom. These officers stick to very strict rules and procedures. If you need to find out more, then you can click on the Immigration Rules and Diplomatic Service Procedures Entry Clearance. If you have a valid UK visa, you will not normally be refused entry to the UK on arrival, unless your circumstances have changed, you gave false information, or you did not tell the entry clearance officer important facts when you applied for your visa. So let's assume that you have your entry visa, which, by the way, is only valid up to a certain date. At your UK port of arrival, the visa tells the immigration officer there the purpose of your travel, how long you can stay in the UK, and the latest date that you can enter the UK. Normally, you may enter and leave the UK as many times as you like during the validity of your visa. Okay, let's go back to the question: Do you need a visa? If you look on the screen now, you will see a picture of the first page of the form. Do I need a UK visa? We find that a few people spend hours filling out visa application forms, only to discover that they don't need a visa. You can use this questionnaire to find out if you need a visa or entry clearance to enter or transit. Through the UK, please note that the rules can change sometimes, so it's a good idea to visit the news page and the Visa and DATV Nationals page. You can see that this is recommended on the form. Going down the form, we see the purpose of visit section: au pair, business, doctor, medical treatment, to see one's fiance, returning resident, student for more than six months. And dozens more. I must stress again that it is very important that you answer all the questions truthfully and accurately. Even an accidental mistake can ruin your chances of getting a visa, possibly forever. Next, we have country of nationality. Please note that this refers to the passport you hold or that you will hold, and not to where you are living or staying now. That is the next question. Current location, which is quite simple, so as well helping you find out if you need a visa, you can also find out where you should make your application, as well as which application form you need to fill in, and which guidance note you should read. Now, some of you here I know wish to sponsor a visitor to the UK, and others of you have a sponsor for your visit. The basic rules. 
applying to a sponsored visitor are 1. He or she wishes to stay in the UK as a visitor for no more than six months. 2. He or she intends to leave the United Kingdom on completion of his or her visit. And 3. He or she has enough money to live without working and without needing help from public funds, such as income support or housing benefit. Good morning, madam, sir. My name is Bob Smith. I'm doing a survey of people's shopping preferences and how it relates to their thoughts about the environment. I'd be very grateful if you could spare a few minutes of your time. The environment, you say? Well, I think it's very important. It's terrible what's happening. You can't pick up a newspaper without reading about melting ice caps and tigers going extinct. I'm very worried about my grandchildren's future. Oh, don't carry on, dear. Are we going to help this gentleman, or do you have to get to your meeting? It's the environment. Of course we're going to help him. My meeting can wait. Looks like we can spare you a few minutes. By the way, what's your name again, Bob? Right, Bob. I'm John, and this is Joan. Great. Good to meet you. You don't mind me asking who you are doing this for and what the purpose is. I don't want to go out giving information that will help those big corporations sell more junk food to children. Don't worry, it's the opposite. I work for the Green Market Research Company based in West London. We specialize in helping environmentally responsible companies tell consumers why they should buy their products rather than products that have a more damaging effect on the environment. Well, that's a good thing. All those poisons the big companies are putting in our food and air. Have you read about the polar bears and seals in the Arctic having very high levels of PCBs, pesticides, and lots of other terrible things in them? And there are no factories where they live. It's okay, dear. Why don't we see what the gentleman wants to know? Yes, well, thank you, sir. Look, uh, why don't we sit down at that table? Can I get you a coffee, tea or something? Oh, I'd love a cup of tea. My husband always has black coffee. Sure. Anyway, can I begin by asking you what you believe is the most serious environmental problem humans are facing nowadays? Well, there are so many. But since I retired, I've been doing a lot of reading about this. So much information on the Internet. I think it's climate change, global warming. Global warming. And, John, uh, may I call you John? Please do. And does this make any difference to your shopping decisions? It certainly does. For example, we bought a new fridge a week ago. We're both pensioners, so we're a bit careful about how we spend our money. We had already decided we didn't need such a big fridge. We'd had the old one since the kids left home over 20 years. But we also decided to look for the most energy-efficient fridge. Yes, it cost 20 pounds more than the second most efficient one. But John worked out we would soon save more on our electricity bill. So what was the main reason you chose the most expensive one? Saving money or saving energy to reduce the effect on global warming? Oh, global warming, certainly. The money savings were secondary. And did the salesman where you bought it mention global warming before you did that? Oh, no. I think he thought we were a bit strange. But he was too polite to show it. But he did point out the lower electricity bills. And you, Joan, what do you think is the most serious environmental problem? Well, John and I both agree that it is global warming. What about the second most serious? Oh. It must be all those pesticides and other chemicals. Do you know that we are all walking around with hundreds of chemicals inside us that Mother Nature never intended to be there? John, what was that name they used? P.O. something. Persistent Organic Pollutants, dear. P.O.P.s. That's it. P.O.P.s. Well, they are so harmful. All that cancer. It's terrible. I agree. 
And what difference, if any, does this make to your shopping? Well, we love gardening, so we grow most of our own vegetables now. But when we buy food, we always go to the health food store and buy organic fruits and vegetables. And our children do the same now. It costs a bit more, but it's getting cheaper as more and more people insist on it. And the farmers are happy not to work with all those pesticides and herbicides. So we try to do our bit for the planet. That's great. Okay, let's drink our tea and coffee and then we'll carry on. Good morning, everybody. As most of you know, I'm Professor Rosemary Parkinson, and as I'm sure you all know, else you wouldn't be here, I'm going to give a talk on good study habits and developing a study plan. First of all, why do I think such a talk will be helpful to, to you? After all, you are all first year university students, although I see some familiar faces here. So, I guess some of you have been at our university for much more than a week or so. But the point is, you've all been students for 12 years or more, so surely you know all about studying. Well, it seems rather strange, but all of us spend years at school learning maths, physics, chemistry, history, languages, all sorts of things. But how many of us have ever been to a class? Where they try to teach us how to learn, how to study, in the most efficient and enjoyable way. I say enjoyable because learning things we don't enjoy learning, that we think we have no interest in, is such a bore. But in fact, many studies show that most of us enjoy studying most things if we do it right, if we study properly in an active way. That constantly uses our creativity, that makes us excited about what is coming next, that gives us the satisfaction of having solved a problem. How many of you know people who hate studying but love doing crosswords or playing computer games that challenge their minds and their reflexes? Lots of you, I'm sure. Well, one objective is to learn to enjoy studying in the same way we enjoy those crosswords and computer games. Okay, we'll come back to that later. Now, I want to discuss a few basics. One, regular exercise. Countless studies show that regular physical exercise, say 40 minutes or so, five days a week of jogging. Fast walking, weight training, tennis, whatever you enjoy, puts you in a more positive frame of mind and also increases creativity and memory for hours after the exercise. Other important things are to eat good, healthy food, get enough sleep, and try not to spend too much time and money in the student bar. There's nothing worse than trying to learn something or solve a problem than when you have a hangover. So, as the Romans used to say, mens sana in corpora sano, a healthy mind in a healthy body. Right, now we're all going to keep fit and healthy. What about the studying? First, you must work out the times that you will use for study. When I say study, I mean all the schoolwork, writing essays, reading, etc., that you do out of class. Be realistic. Don't plan to spend 60 hours a week on it. It's too much for most of us. Set aside one or two blocks of time, each of say two or two and a half hours a day, that are your study time. As I say, Be realistic. Don't set yourself such an ambitious goal that you will never stick to it. And it's also a good idea to leave one day a week, Sunday perhaps, completely free, so you can relax and occasionally do some schoolwork at those times when it builds up a bit. That's time settled.
Now for place. We are creatures of habit. We do things better when we do them in places that we associate with a particular activity. In this case, studying. So it's best to try and set aside a quiet place, perhaps your bedroom, a study if you have one, which is where you study. When the weather is nice, it could be outdoors. Nothing is nicer than reading and thinking about that novel you have to read for English Literature One Hundred One on a quiet, grassy bank by a stream on a sunny day. And we mustn't forget the library. Most of us find that studying, surrounded by the learning of centuries, is inspiring, as though studying is the only proper thing to do in a library. Okay, time, place, what next? It is questions. Before you set out to read something, always ask yourself: What questions do I want and expect to be answered in this chapter or this paper? Don't simply start reading and hoping to absorb information like a sponge. Give the information somewhere to go, like little hooks in your brain to hang it on. These hooks are the questions you've thought of. And don't try to do too much at a time. After, say, forty or fifty minutes, put the book down and tell yourself what you've learnt, what questions have been answered, what it means. Spend a few minutes on this and take a short walk while you're doing it.